The Flame Spirit, The Prophet of the Long Road, The Midnight Rider, The American Saint. Francis Asbury was one of the first two bishops of the Methodist Episcopal Church in the United States, along with Thomas Koch. Although he was not actually born in America, Asbury was the leading figure of American Methodism in the 18th century, and his contribution to the Methodist movement is undeniable. Out of all the Methodist missionaries that John Wesley sent to America, Francis Asbury was the only one who stayed through the American Revolution as a Methodist preacher. Over the span of his 45-year ministry in America, he traveled nearly 300,000 miles across the rustic American landscape on horseback. He preached over 16,000 sermons and ordained approximately 4,000 ministers. Asbury was so well-traveled that he was more recognizable face-to-face than George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. In fact, during his lifetime, over a thousand people named their children after him because he was so loved and so well-known. So join us today on this episode of the Methodical Methodist Podcast as we explore the life and ministry of Francis Asbury. Hello and welcome to the Methodical Methodist Podcast, a podcast where we talk about why the church is still relevant for us today as we explore themes connected to religion, politics, pop culture, faith, and yes, even the church. Together, we can find out what it means to live into the mission of the church by making disciples. Now, let's get methodical. Hello, everyone. I am your host, the Reverend Andrew Lay, and I am excited to spend this time on the podcast today. If you like the show, hope that you might take a minute to subscribe, rate, and write a review for the podcast. It helps to boost the show and make it to where more people can find it. You can also find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash methodicalpod, and you can find me on Instagram as well. My handle is at methodicalpod, so be sure to check me out. Okay, well, let's jump into today's episode. Francis Asbury was born on August 20th, 1745, in Handsworth, England, near Hampstead Bridge, just outside of Birmingham, to his parents, Joseph and Eliza Rogers Asbury. He was the younger of two children. He had one older sister named Sarah, and Francis, or Frankie as his family called him, came from humble beginnings. His father, Joseph, worked as a farmhand and a gardener for two wealthy families in Handsworth. Then, while Francis was still young, the Asbury family moved to a cottage on Newton Road in the nearby town of Great Bar, and that cottage is actually still standing today. It is believed that Joseph worked at the Malt House, which was a brewery that was actually connected to their home. So Francis grew up in a working-class family, and because of that, He had very limited resources when it came to education. But despite that, his parents were still determined to try to give him the best education possible. His mother, Eliza, taught young Frank to read the Bible by the time he was five years old, and he quickly fell in love with reading. He attended Snell's Green, which was the only school in the area, and it sounds horrible. Um, He did love to learn but he hated the headmaster of the school, Arthur Taylor, who, according to Asbury, was a great churl and used to beat me cruelly. He filled me with such horrible dread that with me anything was more preferable to going to school. Um, Wow, that guy just sounds like a classy guy to me. I don't know, I'm kind of picturing the uh, schoolmaster from Matilda, just this evil (laughs) schoolmaster. Um, It's probably no surprise that that Asbury decided to leave school at the age of 13 to become a servant to a family that Asbury described as one of the wealthiest and most ungodly families we had in the parish. 
Uh, he was only there for a few months before he left to work as an apprentice. And this was a pretty common pattern for young men during this time. They would often go to school and they would then become servants for a few years around the age of 12 or 13. And then they would start an apprenticeship around the age of 14. That being said, there were a lot of children who had little to no schooling at all. So the fact that Asbury was able to have the little education that he did, especially coming from a working class family, was actually pretty uh, remarkable. Asbury worked as an apprentice to a local metal worker. Scholars suggest he either worked for a man named John Griffin or Thomas Foxell, or maybe even both. But while he was doing this, Asbury also learned how to understand the lives of working people, which would help him connect with people, especially when he was serving as a missionary in America. The Asbury family was not considered to be the most religious family, but after Francis's sister Sarah passed away in May 1749 at the age of six years old, that started to change. Um, this death was incredibly hard, particularly for, for uh, Asbury's mother, Eliza, who suffered serious depression years after her daughter's death. And on top of this, during the same time, Francis himself almost lost his own life. One day when little Frank was very young, he got in the upper room of his family's cottage above uh, where his father Joseph kept all of his gardening tools. Long shears, pruning saws, hoes, rakes... And Frank, when he was up in that upper room, he fell through this small hole in the floor. And luckily, he, he landed on the boiler, which somewhat broke his fall. And this near-death experience was something that his parents and Francis himself would talk about for years to come. The family came to believe that this was an example of God's providence. And after losing Sarah, the family had been given a second chance with young Frank. By 1742, which is three years before Francis was born, the Wesley brothers were preaching less than three miles from the Asbury's cottage. John had first received support from the priests there, but that by the next year, that had all changed. By 1743, now John was being greeted with mobs and threats of the crowds literally trying to knock out his brains by throwing rocks at his head. And despite all of this, the Wesleys still gained several followers. One of them was Eliza Asbury. Eliza became a massive Methodist supporter. She was known for seeking out anybody in the area that she could get to join the movement. And of course, little Frankie followed his mother's convictions and followed her footsteps. And as a young boy, he learned the importance of prayer and family reading and singing the Psalms and reading the Bible. And at the age of 13, Asbury had a conversion experience. He was invited to a prayer meeting and was convinced that there was more to religion than he originally thought. He began to pray morning and evening and began to read the sermons of many Anglican preachers, including the sermons of George Whitfield one of the uh, Oxford Methodists that was friends with John and Charles Wesley. He began attending uh, Methodist meetings with his mother, and he heard preachers like John Fletcher and Benjamin Ingham, possible future topics for the podcast. And Asbury began to search for the assurance of salvation that these preachers were talking about. And Asbury's conversion experience is much like John Wesley's in the sense that it didn't happen all in one instance. Instead, over time, both of these men felt God's grace and presence working in their lives. I think um, salvation for a lot of folks is not a one-time event. Instead, Wesley saw conversion as a vocation, something that is worked out on a daily basis. And at the age of 16, Francis began seriously studying and praying and reading Scripture. He joined a Methodist class meeting which John Wesley required of all Methodists. And these classes contained at least 12 members, but they were often much larger, and they were designed to foster Christian discipleship. He also joined another small group called a band. And these bands were, were smaller. They had about five to ten members in them, 
and they were designed for those who wanted to take their commitment to the next level. In these bands, these group members shared their lives together, and they held nothing back. It was a very intimate group. Um, It would be a group that was made of all men or a group that was made of all women. They wouldn't mix uh, sexes. But in these groups, Asbury's spiritual life grew deeper and stronger. And by the age of 18, Francis was already preaching sermons and holding Methodist meetings in his family's cottage. And while Francis was serving as an apprentice, he also became an official Methodist local preacher. And he found so much joy in this position. He wrote about this experience in his journal saying, Behold me now a local preacher, the humble and willing servant of any and of every preacher that called on me by night or by day, being ready with hasty steps to go far and wide to do good, visiting Derbyshire, Staffordshire, Warwickshire, Worcestershire. Uh, Man, he, he visited a lot of shires, didn't he? And he goes on to say, Indeed, almost every place within my reach for the sake of precious souls. As a local preacher, Asbury worked very long hours. His days would always start at 4 o'clock in the morning, and they would often end around midnight. He would preach four or five nights in the week and oftentimes hold three or four meetings on Sunday. And this type of work ethic is something that Asbury continued his entire life. He served as a local preacher for about three years until in 1766, at the age of 20, he accepted a position as a traveling preacher, and he was assigned to uh, the Staffordshire circuit. And at this point, he had been working as a metalworker's apprentice for six years, but he gave all of that up in order to focus on his new preaching gig. And just a year later, in 1767, After his supervisor, William Orp, recommended that Asbury receive a regular appointment, Asbury joined Wesley's traveling connection on a trial period. He served as a probationary minister. He became one of 104 itinerant, or traveling, preachers who were serving 26,000 members on 41 circuits throughout England, Scotland, and Ireland. Asbury was assigned to the Bedfordshire circuit, which was a day's ride north from London. This was an especially challenging place to serve. There was a report of one Methodist preacher in this circuit being hit in the head with a dead cat. Uh, So I guess that gives you an idea of some of the things that Asbury might have been dealing with. Uh, But throughout the, the challenges he faced, Asbury stuck with it. In August 1768, Asbury was admitted into a full connection and earned his conference membership. As a member in full connection, Asbury moved around quite a bit. He was assigned to the Colchester circuit, and just a few months later, he was transferred over to the Wiltshire circuit. And then in August 1769, Francis moved yet again, and he went actually back to the Bedfordshire circuit. Then at the August 1770 conference, Asbury was sent to the Wiltshire circuit, where he had already been briefly uh, two years earlier. And it it sounds like appointment making back then was just absolutely insane. (laughs) Um, It doesn't sound like there was very much rhythm or reason or rhyme to it. But uh, I don't know. Who knows? Uh, They could have had some really good reasons for all of this. Um, but, But then on August 1771 in Bristol... Asbury attended his only English annual conference, and at this conference, uh, they talked about the growing need for Methodist preachers in America. John Wesley had already appointed four preachers to America, Joseph Pilmore, Richard Boardman, Robert Williams, and John King, and he was asking for more volunteers to go over and to help them, and so he chose two of the five volunteers, Richard Wright, and Francis Asbury. So at the age of 26 years old, Francis made his way over to the colonies. And when he went to tell his parents the news, his father Joseph, who was not known for showing much emotion at all, actually started weeping. And he said, I shall never see him again. His mother took the news even harder, if you can believe it. 
um, even though at the time Asbury only expected to be, to be gone for just a few years, his father was right. They would actually never see their son again. Asbury said his goodbyes, and he set sail for America on September 4th, 1771. He had no money, not even a penny, which is insane to me. But fortunately, local Methodists gave him 10 pounds and some clothing to get him through until he reached America. After nearly eight long weeks of sailing across the ocean, Asbury finally arrived in Philadelphia on October 27, 1771. And when he arrived in America, Asbury had two main challenges that he focused on. The first was to deal with a lack of discipline in Philadelphia and in New York. The second was to form a connection with the Methodist movements going on in the South. And these movements were under the leadership of part-time Irish and English ministers. Asbury soon met Joseph Pilmore and Richard Boardman, who were working and preaching in Philadelphia and in New York. And Asbury quickly found that these preachers had really confined themselves to their respective cities instead of following Wesley's principle of itineracy. Again, itineracy is this idea of traveling around instead of staying put in one place. Boardman was staying in New York, and Pilmore was staying in Philadelphia. They were not traveling around and preaching like John Wesley had mandated his preachers to do. So Asbury was very upset when he saw this, and he complained about this in his journal, and this is what he wrote. I find that the preachers have their friends in the cities and care not to leave them. Unfortunately, Pilmore and Boardman were Asbury's superiors, and Pilmore had actually gained quite a bit of popularity with the folks in Philadelphia. So Asbury was unable to confront them in the way that he might have wanted. So Asbury decided to put his nose to the grindstone and to lead by example instead. And amazingly, over time, Asbury actually convinced Pilmore and Boardman to itinerate. Boardman traveled throughout New England, while Pilmore headed south and preached throughout Virginia and eventually made his way as far south as Savannah, Georgia, a place where John Wesley had once served early on in his ministry. But there was another thing that upset Asbury when it came to Pilmore and Boardman. Asbury was frustrated with their failure to follow the Methodist discipline. Over time, Pilmore and Boardman had become less and less strict about the folks um, and how they followed the Methodist rules. Specifically, they were not holding regular class or band meetings. They were failing to hold these small groups that were really at the core of of the Methodist movement itself. And ultimately, after Wesley heard about this, he sent word to the Methodist preachers in America, and he took Asbury's side. Then perhaps in order to solidify his support of Asbury, Wesley chose Asbury to secede Boardman as the supervisor of the preachers in America. And as the supervisor of the preachers in America, Asbury continued his travels and he met local preachers and lay leaders like Robert Strawbridge and Robert Williams and John King. And as he traveled, he worked to strengthen the organizational structure of Methodism. And he regulated the class meetings wherever he could. But during this process, he came to realize a problem with one of his preachers. The Irish-born Robert Strawbridge, who was serving in Maryland. Asbury learned that Strawbridge was administering the sacraments, but the only problem was Strawbridge was not actually ordained. Asbury certainly had sympathy for Strawbridge, and he saw why he had started administering the sacraments. After all, there was no one else around to do this, and so Strawbridge took matters into his own hands. Asbury realized that Strawbridge had a great deal of influence over Methodism, especially in Maryland, but he also knew that he couldn't allow Strawbridge to go on like this indefinitely. And so he decided to compromise enough to keep Strawbridge in Methodism and left the ultimate outcome for a later date. Because of all the issues that Asbury was having in regulating the structure of the Methodist movement, John Wesley decided to bring in reinforcements. In 1773, 
George Stafford and Thomas Rankin were sent to um, America by John Wesley in order to enforce the Methodist system of membership, closed class meetings, and society meetings. Rankin pretty much immediately removed Pilmore and Boardman from their appointments and worked to right the ship that had started to veer off course. Then, while he was preaching in the southern part of the country on September 1773, um, Francis was struck with malaria. And during this time, he experienced fevers, chills, and sweats, and these symptoms lasted over the span of several months. These episodes would sometimes last up to four days at a time, and then they would go away for, for a few days just to come back a few days later. It completely zapped his energy, so much so that he actually stopped writing in his journal for about two weeks in October. While he was sick, he hardly took any medication, and he had very little access to doctors. And this might have actually been a, a good thing, considering most doctors back then were in the practice of bloodletting, um, so in the end, it was probably safer without any care from an actual doctor. But, but during the worst part of his malaria attack in October of that year, Asbury stayed with Josiah and Sarah Dollum in their home in Maryland. And during this time, Sarah acted as his nurse. She waited on him day and night, and many attribute him surviving this disease because of her care. Even still... Asbury continued to suffer and struggle with symptoms for several months after this. Six months later, in May 1774, Asbury attended the Second American Methodist Conference in Philadelphia. By this time, membership had grown from 1,160 to 2,073. The full-time preachers were also up from 10 to 17, and even though most of the past year Asbury had been fighting malaria, he had only grown more and more in popularity among the American Methodists. In fact, between the time when he first contracted malaria to the following year in July, Asbury managed to preach about 300 times and ride nearly 2,000 miles. He literally preached 300 times and rode 2,000 miles on horseback with malaria. So yeah, that kind of tells you a little bit about what kind of man Asbury was. However, during this time, it was also becoming apparent that Asbury and Rankin, his supervisor, were experiencing a distrust and a dislike for one another. Rankin, who was kind of Wesley's inside man that had come to keep the American Methodists in line, believed that Methodism should always remain at the center of England. But Asbury, on the other hand, was starting to see American Methodism as a separate entity. Uh, this makes sense considering Asbury is living in America and had spent far more time with American preachers. Asbury knew a lot of the American Methodists, and he was gaining more and more popularity, especially with the younger uh, preachers, particularly the preachers in the South. And when he heard about the revivals taking place in Virginia that were making around 600 new disciples and creating six new preaching circuits, Asbury knew that he had to go. And so in October 1775, Asbury headed down to the Brunswick Circuit, which was at the heart of the revival. And Asbury was amazed at what he found. People were experiencing some incredible preaching and worship, and people were coming to know about God's love and grace in their lives. But everything would soon change. The Revolutionary War was about to sweep across the American landscape. Asbury had pretty much maintained an apolitical stance. He did not take a side one way or another. But tensions began to rise among Methodists when John Wesley wrote a pamphlet entitled, A Calm Address to Our American Colonies. But this did not calm the American Methodists. Instead, it had the opposite effect. Both of the Wesley brothers, John and Charles, criticized the Americans. They were completely against the American Revolution, and their allegiance remained with England and the king. So, as you can imagine... This created some tension among the American 
Methodists. As the war began, most of the British Methodist preachers returned to England, but Asbury refused even when he was given other opportunities and even when John Wesley himself tried to call him back home. Asbury wrote that he could not leave such a field for gathering souls to Christ as we have here in America. It would be an eternal dishonor to the Methodist that we should all leave 3,000 souls who desire to commit themselves to our care. Neither is it the part of a good shepherd to leave his flock in a time of danger. Therefore, I am determined by the grace of God not to leave them. Let the consequences be what it may. Luckily, by the time Asbury wrote this, Wesley had already changed his mind on the matter. Although he was still completely against the American Revolution, he conceded to Asbury's wish and let him remain in America, which honestly, Asbury was going to do either way, whether Wesley gave him permission or not. In the winter of 1778, Asbury took up residence in Delaware in the home of Judge Thomas White. Delaware was a prominent place during the war that had some of the heaviest fighting. And unfortunately, because Asbury was British, it was too dangerous for him to travel openly. But somehow, during the year 1778, his least active year, Asbury still managed to preach at least 95 times, attend numerous prayer meetings, and meet with several full-time ministers. But things became even more dangerous for Asbury when his host, Judge White, was arrested on some trumped-up charges. This was probably because White had remained fairly neutral during the war. And because of this, Asbury was forced to move around and stay with other Methodist members. Eventually, White was released after challenging his arrest on legal grounds, and Asbury was able to move back in with the White family. As the American Revolution came to an end, dissent began to rise within the Methodist ranks. Southern Methodist preachers began following Robert Strawbridge's uh, lead in administering the sacraments even though they were not officially ordained. Even though Asbury did not condone this behavior and even spoke out against this, he was still able to keep the Southern Methodists from breaking off on their own. During a special conference, Asbury tried to make a compromise with the Southern preachers. Asbury proposed a one-year suspension of the Southern preachers when it came to administering the sacraments. And ultimately, and very surprisingly, the Southern Methodists actually agreed. And so Asbury continued to travel throughout the South, and as he did, he came to earn the respect of the hearts and minds of the Southern Methodists, and, and they ultimately came to see him as a leader. He was kind of known for not asking any of his preachers to do something that he himself was not willing to do. He was really able to create this connection between Methodists in the North and the Methodists in the South, and he created one united body. During this time, American Methodists began writing John Wesley in support of Asbury. They were impressed with his leadership and they lobbied to Wesley for him to make Asbury the general assistant in America. This position was the highest rank of any preacher in America, a position that was formerly held by Thomas Rankin, who had fled back to England during the Revolutionary War. John Wesley wrote a letter back to some of the American Methodist leaders, voicing his support of Asbury, saying, Brother Asbury is raised up to preserve order among you and to do just what I should do myself if it pleased God to bring me to America. And it was actually really surprising for me to hear that even though everyone seemed to love Francis Asbury, he actually wasn't a very good preacher at all. He uh, wasn't very eloquent or captivating in the pulpit, and people had a hard time following his train of thought and his sermons, but he just had this really great personality and a really good sense of humor. And he was really good at building relationships as well. But perhaps his most important attribute was his leadership and how he was able to organize the Methodist movement in America. Perhaps one thing that made him so successful 
was that he never married, and this actually allowed him to travel constantly and remain focused on the mission at hand. During the 1780s, Methodism began to spread, and membership climbed from 8,500 in 1780 to 57,600 in 1790. And the preaching circuits expanded from 21 to 98. This huge growth led to separation from England to an independent American Methodist church in 1784. And Francis Asbury was at the head of the ship. Wesley had seen the expansion take place in England, and he knew that the expansion in America was even greater. Methodists did not have access to the sacraments from the Anglican priests, especially in America, and and Wesley knew that that was a problem. So in 1784, at the age of 81, Wesley made the decision to ordain Methodist preachers. Initially, he did this in order to maintain control over American Methodism and try to keep the American movement within the Anglican tradition. Wesley ordained Richard Watcoat and Thomas Vassey as deacons and then elders, which is the equivalent of an ordained priest. And then he ordained Thomas Coke, who was already an ordained priest in the Church of England, as a superintendent. And he made plans for Coke to travel to America and ordain Asbury as a superintendent as well once he arrived in America. In November 1784, Asbury and Coke met with a few other preachers in Barrett's Chapel just south of Dover, Delaware. And they decided to call a general conference in Baltimore. The Christmas Conference of 1784 took place on Christmas Eve at Lovely Lane Chapel in Baltimore, Maryland. During this special Christmas conference, 65 of the 85 active itinerant preachers voted unanimously to create an independent church that was free of its connection to the Church of England. They also elected Coke and Asbury to serve as the superintendents of this new body. The role of superintendent will later be changed to the term bishop, and we'll talk about that here in a bit. But during this conference, on the first day, Thomas Coke ordained Asbury as a deacon, the next day as an elder, and then the day after that as a superintendent. And his fellow superintendent, Thomas Coke, preached at Francis Asbury's ordination. Here is an excerpt from that sermon. Humility. This is the preserving power and guard of every other grace. As once was said, other graces without humility are like a fine powder in the wind without a cover. Let us be ever so zealous, work ever so hard. Yet if we want humility, we will be only like Penelope with a web in the ancient fable, undoing at one time what we do at another. There is something interwoven with human nature, which immediately recoils at the very appearance of pride. But this man, Francis Asbury, is clothed with humility. When no other grace shines forth, still we discern this beautiful veil. The Christmas Conference of 1784 marked the founding of the Methodist Episcopal Church in America. It marked the formation of a new church in America. And this separation caused quite a bit of tension, especially with Charles Wesley, who we talked about in episode 9. Apparently, when Charles heard about Coke's ordination of Asbury, he sarcastically wrote, A Roman emperor, tis said, his favorite horse a council made. But Coke brings greater things to pass. He made a bishop of an ass. So that just gives you an idea of how Charles felt about the matter. But still, a new church was born. And with that came excitement and drive. Together, Coke and Asbury formed a Methodist college, which was named Cokesbury College. Unfortunately, the college burned down not once, but twice. And after the second time, it was not rebuilt. However, there is a really great online bookstore by the name Cokesbury. Just saying. 
Another one of the missions that Coke and Asbury tried to take on was to try to eradicate slavery in America. They drafted a petition calling for the immediate or gradual extermination of slavery. Coke and Asbury even met with George Washington at Mount Vernon. Washington supported the petition, but he refused to sign it, um, which is not surprising considering Washington himself owned slave that, slaves. That really wasn't a, a hill that he wanted to die on. However, it is interesting because Asbury was not very big on politics. He was very weary and skeptical of politicians. He kind of thought they were all crooks. But the only politician that Asbury actually admired was George Washington. After their first meeting, Asbury sent George and Martha each their own copy of a Methodist prayer book and a volume of John Wesley's sermons. Despite Coke and Asbury's efforts to eradicate slavery, they were unsuccessful. Not surprisingly, the petition, which was meant to be presented to the Virginia Assembly, completely failed. Ultimately, Coke and Asbury were unable to eradicate slavery in America, and unfortunately, Asbury had to make compromises with the Southern Methodists in order to keep them from splitting off, at least within his lifetime. While American Methodism was growing, John Wesley was still in conversation with Coke and Asbury. In fact, Wesley gave instructions to Coke to ordain Richard Watcoat, a Methodist minister, as a joint superintendent with Wesley. But during the South Carolina Conference, the American Methodists made the decision to change the superintendent's title to bishop instead. And when Wesley heard about this change, he wrote a scathing letter to Asbury, where he addressed him as, My dear Frankie. This is what he says. How can you, how dare you, suffer yourself to be called bishop? I shudder. I start at the very thought. Men may call me a knave or a fool, a rascal, a scoundrel, and I am content. But they shall never, by my consent, call me a bishop. For my sake, for God's sake, for Christ's sake, put a full end to this. Asbury received this letter, and it hurt him very deeply. And Asbury was put in a very difficult situation. Coke was pressuring American Methodists to follow Wesley's orders. But the preachers were very resistant. In the end, the American Conference decided not to ordain Richard Watcoat as a joint superintendent. Ultimately, this event helped to solidify and strengthen Asbury's authority as a leader of the Methodist Church. It also widened the rift between Wesley and Asbury. Meanwhile, during all of this controversy surrounding Wesley's proposed ordination of Watcoat, American Methodists were holding uh, huge revivals. Between 1786 to 1788, membership increased from 18,791 white and 1,890 black members to 30,809 white to 6,545 black members. It was a 64% increase in white members and a 246% increase in black members, and an 81% increase overall. Asbury was in the thick of these revivals, preaching at many of them. On one occasion, one member heard Asbury preach what he called, the greatest sermon I have ever heard. Again, this is kind of surprising considering Asbury was not known for his preaching. But by 1790, Francis Asbury had been overseeing and leading a growing and expansive church. Traveling throughout the American landscape, Asbury had reached a breaking point, though. His health was steadily declining. He complained of swelling in his feet, violent headaches, and inflammation in his throat, and a friend advised him not to travel to Kentucky due to his illness and the growing violence between Indians and Kentuckians. Asbury decided to take that advice, 
and to find shelter in Tennessee at the home of Elizabeth Russell, who was a Methodist woman who nursed Asbury back to good health. Over the span of three weeks during this time, while he was still recovering from his sickness, Asbury continued to preach in western Virginia and in eastern Tennessee around Russell's home. Then, on May 3rd, he had a prophetic dream which he told his friend Richard Watcote, who wrote about it in his journal. He wrote this, Last night, Bishop Asbury dreamed that a company was come to conduct him through the wilderness, and that two sedate or calm men came up to him where he was, which was exactly so. Miraculously, the next morning, this dream actually became a reality. Ten men from Kentucky arrived, including the preachers Peter Massey and Hope Hull, which Asbury had identified as the two sedate men that he had just dreamed about. So Asbury took this as a sign and made his way into Kentucky with 16 other men carrying 13 guns. And while they traveled, Asbury, it is said, carved his name and the date May 1st, 1790, onto a powder horn. During this difficult journey, Asbury did not sleep much and clearly took the threat of Indian attacks very, very seriously. But in Kentucky, Asbury came to find crowds of people who were hungry for a religious experience. In his journal, Asbury wrote, It is true. Such exertions of mind and body are trying. But I am supported under it. If souls are saved, it is enough. Meanwhile, James O'Kelly and Thomas Koch began to conspire behind Asbury's back. Asbury had formed a Methodist council to oversee the expansive church and to make decisions on behalf of the overall church. And O'Kelly disagreed with this model. And Thomas Koch actually sided with O'Kelly. But little did O'Kelly know that Koch actually had ulterior motives. He only sided with O'Kelly in an effort to weaken Asbury's Episcopal status as a bishop. So, from this point on, the story gets very complicated. I'm going to do my best to be both accurate and brief at the same time, so just bear with me here. I am not a scholar or a historian, but this is the way that I came to understand what happened. Thomas Koch had been writing letters to Bishop William White, of the Protestant Episcopal Church. Uh, This is the former Church of England in America. And Koch was proposing reconciliation between the Episcopal Church and the Methodist Church in America. As a matter of fact, Koch had been writing these letters while Asbury and Koch had been traveling together, and he had kept them a secret from Asbury. But on April 28, 1791, Koch's plans came crashing to the ground. When while Coke and Asbury were traveling through Virginia, they learned of John Wesley's death. When they heard about Wesley's death, Coke immediately left for England and hoped to win the election of the president of the British Methodists. Ultimately, he was not chosen, although he did later serve briefly in 1797 and again in 1805. But still, Koch managed to meet with Bishop William White in America to go over his plans to unite the Methodist Church back alongside the Church of England. Ultimately, Koch's plan failed miserably. In the following years, Koch would travel back and forth between America and England. But after this, Koch and Asbury's relationship uh, was pretty strained. Although they were able to move past their differences later on, um, During this time, things were still pretty rough between these two bishops. Koch was arguing that Asbury had figuratively stabbed Wesley in the back and literally hastened his death. And because of that, Asbury was worthy of eternal damnation. So, yeah, that's that's pretty rough. Um, It was evident, however, to most people who actually knew the situation of America that Asbury was too loved by the people for Coke to successfully double-cross him. And perhaps more than that, 
The American Methodists would not be willing to give up their, their ordinations or live under the thumb of the oppressive Church of England bishops. America had just recently gained their independence from England, and the Methodists had just recently gained their independence from the Church of England. Coke eventually came to this realization and wrote to Asbury trying to backtrack some of his earlier statements, almost as a way to kind of apologize. At first, Asbury merely wrote back, If you come here to America again, you would see trouble, which I personally think is such a great (laughs) response. And you know, the, the relationship between the two men did get better, and Coke did return to America several times in the following years. But really, Asbury was functioning as the only bishop of the Methodist Episcopal Church at this point. On November 1st, 1792, Asbury and almost half of the church's 266 itinerant preachers showed up for the first quadrennial general conference in Baltimore, Maryland. Leading up to this, Asbury was still experiencing, believe it or not, some criticism and pushback from a few of his preachers, specifically James O'Kelly. Yep, the same one who had been plotting with Coke behind Asbury's back. During the conference, O'Kelly spoke out against Asbury's Episcopal powers as a bishop, and he continued to argue that his powers should be lessened and limited. Specifically, he made a motion that preachers should be able to appeal to the conference if he objects to his appointment. He argued further that district conferences should be the ones to elect the presiding elders instead of allowing the bishops to appoint them. Early on in the conference, Asbury withdrew himself from the meetings, complaining of a cold. This probably had more to do with the fact that he was uncomfortable in this type of setting. This is kind of a a trend that he kept up in almost every conference he attended. He was often silent or said very little. Even though he was a leader of this church, and these were his preachers, Asbury was too reserved to feel comfortable in the room. However, he did write a letter explaining his point of view. He wrote this, Are you sure that if you please yourself, the people will be fully satisfied? They often say, Let us have such a preacher. And sometimes, we will not have such a preacher. We will soon pay him to stay at home. Perhaps I must say, his appeal forced upon you. In other words, Asbury argued that itineracy was necessary for the health and the growth of the church. He was afraid that if the preachers were able to have control over their appointments, you know, where they were sent to preach, that they might become complacent. And ultimately, the general conference sided with Asbury. Even still, schism was still knocking at the door. After the general conference met, then Asbury made his way to the Virginia conference, where much of the divisiveness was brewing due to O'Kelly. This was an extremely exhausting time for Asbury, who was again battling poor health. He slept only 16 hours over the course of four nights. He had a severe chill, a terrible cough, a fever, and a sick stomach which he battled over the next two months. Remarkably, Asbury was able to ordain four elders and six deacons during this conference. And he knew that he could not maintain this old model of doing things. The preachers had rejected his original idea of having a council of elders, which essentially included an executive committee to make decisions on behalf of the church. So if the preachers were not agreeable to this idea, he knew that he had to do something else instead. He was too sick to make it across the Appalachian Mountains in the spring for their conference, so he decided to write the presiding elders in the western districts to run their own conferences. He wrote the 26-year-old John Kobler, who was a presiding elder of the Holston District in Tennessee. That may sound uh, familiar to some of y'all listening. But he explained his sickness and authorized him to take the presidency of the conference. And this paved a new way of doing things for Asbury. 
1793, Asbury conducted 14 district conferences. The following year, he conducted eight district conferences. By 1795 and 1796, he was down to only seven district conferences. He was traveling less, but that does not mean that he slowed down. Now, Asbury had more time to perform pastoral duties. This also gave him the opportunity to reconnect with a group that had been neglected previously. African American Methodists Asbury had essentially spent his entire time traveling across America, making appointments, sending pastors to preaching stations and putting out fires caused by his preachers. He had always been against slavery, but now he was able to find more opportunities to worship with African Americans. He was also able to slow down and again try to confront the injustices of slavery. Asbury started ordaining black preachers even before he had the approval of the General Conference. In Philadelphia, Asbury came across Richard Allen, who was a former slave who had become a Methodist at the age of 16. He was impressed with Allen's abilities and ordained him as a preacher. Allen had a dream to form a new church specifically for African American Methodists, and Asbury actually supported his vision. He reconfigured the leadership of Philadelphia Methodism in Allen's favor, and he placed pastors who were known to be friendly to African Americans around Richard Allen to help support him. Allen ended up purchasing a new building for a place of worship, and Asbury actually came and preached the dedication sermon for the new church, which was called Bethel. In 1816, Richard Allen would go on to establish the first national black church in the United States, the African Methodist Episcopal Church. So Asbury was certainly supportive of Allen and, uh, and his ministry. Then, a few years after the first quadrennial general conference, Asbury, along with 120 preachers in Baltimore, gathered together for the second quadrennial general conference in 1796. Thomas Koch actually came to this one, even though he only arrived from London just a few days before the conference began. During this conference, they formed boundaries of six permanent annual conferences, New England, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Virginia, South Carolina, and the Western Conference. This was a reduction, actually, from the 20 conferences that had originally been set up. And this made it so much easier for the bishops to attend the conferences. This had been a tremendous strain, especially on Asbury. And I think people could see at this point that Asbury's health was really starting to fail. They knew that if Asbury died... Coke would only let them down. Interestingly enough, Coke promised his services to America, but the American preachers were skeptical. In fact, one preacher by the name of Jesse Lee opposed Coke, and the only reason Coke was not overthrown was because Francis Asbury intervened. He said, Friends at first are friends at last, and I hope to never be divided. I actually think that this really tells you a lot about Asbury's character. He was willing to stick up for a man who had plotted against him. In the end, Coke became what was called a reserve bishop. In other words, he only assumed full Episcopal power when Asbury was absent. So ironically, Coke was trying to lessen Asbury's power, but the reverse actually ended up happening. As the century drew to a close, Asbury continued to fight sickness and death began to cast a shadow over him. But even in times of severe sickness, dealing with fevers and coughs and pains, Asbury continued to travel over 2,000 miles on horseback through Maryland, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York. And by the end of that journey, he was swelling from his face his bowels, and his feet. In fact, his feet were so sore that he could not stand up for two weeks. I mean, this guy just did not know when to stop. He pushed through the pain and continued traveling throughout America. It's like Indiana Jones says, it's not the years, it's the mileage. And even though he was only around 50 years old, Asbury had certainly put on the miles. In 
But still, Asbury was just very sick during this time. He didn't preach for eight weeks, which I'm sure must have been very difficult for a preacher like him. And during this time, he began to think about who might follow him as a leader of this new and thriving church. First, he thought of Thomas Koch, but he ultimately came to the decision that he needed to resign and the church needed to elect a new bishop. When preachers came for the Philadelphia Conference in October 1797, they took one look at Francis Asbury and decided that Jesse Lee should become his full-time traveling companion. So the two men traveled to Baltimore to conduct the region's annual conference. Jesse Lee ended up presiding over that conference because Asbury was so sick. Then the two made their way to the Virginia Conference, and when they arrived, the preachers were stunned at how bad Asbury looked. He knew he could not continue to do all of this work by himself, so he sent Jesse Lee to preside at the South Carolina Conference in Charleston. Finally, by April 1798, Asbury was well enough to travel by carriage, which he did for the next several years. But his health just continued to decline more and more. He even wrote, I cannot serve the connection without sacrificing my health, my life, or my conscience. In August 1799, Asbury wrote this, I have only to say, I'm writing my resignation to the General Conference. I firmly believe I have delayed my resignation too long. It is time they were put upon ways, means, and persons for the better organization of so great a body of people. I wish the preachers and the people to take warning. I am about to come down from joyless height and stand upon the floor with my brethren. In 1800, Asbury continued to make appointments and was pretty much still the sole leader of the Methodist Episcopal Church. He also continued to preach. And even though he was never considered to be a very good preacher, his sermon seemed even more disjointed during this time. Still, Asbury was able to lead his preachers and continue to press them to devote themselves to the ministry of the world. This was something Asbury did throughout his entire life. And this, again, might have been due to the fact that he never married. Asbury arrived in Baltimore in May 1800 for yet another general conference. This would be the conference where he had intended uh, on resigning from his position as bishop. But the general conference was unwilling to accept his resignation. Asbury, who was now 52, would continue in his role as bishop. The General Conference just could not imagine the church without Asbury as their leader. But the fact remained, Asbury needed help. So on Monday morning, May 12, 1800, Richard Watco was elected as the third bishop of the Methodist Episcopal Church on the second ballot. And ironically, this is the same man whom Wesley had asked to be promoted to joint superintendent with Asbury years ago. But now he was elected as a bishop of the Methodist Episcopal Church. So together, Asbury and Watcote traveled around and performed the duties of a bishop. Coke traveled back and forth from England, doing some work here and there. But by 1806, Richard Watcote's health had declined so much that he actually ended up passing away at the age of 69. So now, Asbury found himself in the same predicament he was six years earlier. Again, Asbury is left leading this entire church pretty much by himself. So, the General Conference of 1808 elected William McKendry to replace Richard Watcote. In addition, the General Conference essentially made the decision to pretty much relieve Thomas Coke of his duties as bishop, although Coke and Asbury remained on friendly terms for the most part. By 1811, Asbury is now 66 years old, and he is just as tough and determined as ever. Asbury was only about 5 feet 9 inches tall and around 151 pounds. He had a very rugged and commanding appearance, and he had these blue eyes that people said um, could look straight through a person. Now, in his older age, he had these deep wrinkles in his face and he wore plain black clothes and a low-crowned, broad-brimmed hat. 
So just picture this weathered old man who is still somehow just super strong and commanding, and he's still attending conferences and performing the duties of a bishop. And at this point, McKendry is also conducting conferences, but only Asbury is fixing appointments. He still was unwilling to give that responsibility up. He is the only one appointing preachers to the different churches. And as the years progressed, of course, Asbury's health declined even more, perhaps because he still pushed himself to travel and preach, never stopping in one place for too long. Then on March 24, 1816, Asbury preached his last sermon in Richmond, Virginia. He was so sick and weak that he had to actually be carried into the church, and he sat on a table while he preached. Then, just a few days later, at the home of George Arnold in Spotsylvania County, Asbury breathed his last breath. By the time of his death, Francis Asbury was already a legend. Everyone knew who he was. He was more recognizable than George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. He had traveled the country on horseback probably more than any other Methodist preacher during this time. And by the time of Francis Asbury's death, the Methodist Episcopal Church in America had grown to 200,000 members. And by the time of the Civil War, that number had grown to 1.5 million people. His contribution to the Methodist Church bears repeating. Over the span of his 45-year ministry in America, he traveled nearly 300,000 miles on horseback as he visited nearly every state each year. He preached over 16,000 sermons and ordained approximately 4,000 ministers. Francis Asbury truly was the flame spirit, the prophet of the long road, the midnight rider, and the American Saint. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Methodical Methodist Podcast. If you have enjoyed this show, I hope you might consider heading on over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review of the show. It is very much appreciated. And until next time, stay methodical.